Okay, shall we play? Okay, play, play. Good subject for tonight. I'm going to approach this problem of contemplation and respect to the way in which Plato outlines the steps leading to the one or the good. Same thing, good or the one. Now this is the fun part. If we take the Republic as our model, there are many studies that are the preliminary studies. It presupposes, of course, that you've already gained a grasp of what he means by music and gymnastics. <clears throat> which is not the popular understanding of it. So you go from arithmetic, as you know, geometry, solid geometry, though that's not yet available. And then we're going to astronomy, harmony. These are the preliminary studies. What's interesting about them is that before you can start this quest to the contemplation of the one, it is already assumed that you must be able to pull these together and see their kinship, what he calls their kinship and their community. Now, this is the prerequisite, understanding what he means by music and gymnastics. And music, as you know, is really being able to recognize certain states of mind. And you're familiar with that in Plato's Republic. And gymnastics is not to build physical strength, but rather power, a sense of power. So these both are not used in the contemporary sense. Now, if you study arithmetic and geometry in the way in which he describes, you're going to study arithmetic, which really is the question of what, after all, is the nature of the one? That's this. What's the goal? Goal is to start. The first study is arithmetic. What's the question? What is it, after all, which is the nature of the one? It has a particular and interesting purpose, you see. It brings one to be able to grasp what he means by being, especially that aspect of being which has the capacity of turning upon itself. Now, that aspect of being, of course, is going to be extremely important because that's the whole problem with man, turning around to be able to see the goal. Geometry is doing the same thing as arithmetic. The same method is going to be applied to arithmetic. Geometry takes the same way of approaching arithmetic and geometry. That's just astronomy. Harmony is going to take the similar methods. So in that sense, there is a kinship and community to it. So let us assume now you have grasped what music and gymnastic is, and you've practiced it to some degree so that you can become involved in this. You're familiar with how he's playing with the idea of the one as an object of study. You can see the way in which that varies through each of these studies of arithmetic, geometry, solid geometry, astronomy, and harmony. You can see that. You can see the whole goal of the study is not only to explore what is the nature of the one, but that turns the person about so they can then therefore encounter this curious thing sometimes called usia, or being, the kind of being that turns upon itself. That's essential. Now then, all right, the contemplation of the one. First prerequisite, the studies prerequisite, seeing their kinship. Right. 
Fourth, being brought to a vision of the idea of the good. Now, when you use this, uh, this, this must always be a capital I because it is not equivalent to a thought, an image, and any mental thing like that. It, in Plato, it, it's a very poor translation to use that because the word is to behold the good. And we're, we have previously identified that as an experience of the nature of beauty itself. What is it about it when it experienced beauty in itself? This is the luminosity. This is the luminosity that reveals the nature of being. It has three aspects. Aspects, not parts, aspects. It, it is an intensely real, therefore we can call it being. There is a vitality to it. It's not dead. Right. And it is mindful intellect. So it has these aspects to it brought together into a unity. Now, the, the goal of this curious game, you see, when you experience this, he says, you really don't have reason. You only gain reason or news out of this experience. It's that experience that brings one to this. Now, what is significant about that is this turning about this turning about is nothing other than intellect turning upon itself. And that's the usia. That's the usia. Therefore, intellect wants to know itself, and in knowing itself, it prepares itself for this final assault, which is the nature of the good or the one. So then, let us assume that we have now someone who has grasped the whole idea that the most important thing to do is to be able to study different states of mind and recognize them as well as their appearance, as well as to whatever degree it is present in a person, as well as its opposite, music. One has already therefore seen the need to generate energy, power, right? not physical strength. Right? Let's assume now that they're familiar with the, the studies of uh, the, the philosopher King, and the, arithmetic, geometry, solid geometry, astronomy, and harmony. All right. They can now see that there's a kinship to them and a community involved. There's something common to them all. They all link together. They're brothers and sisters, as it were. They belong to the same family. Then with that, then, this individual has in some way grasped to some degree, hopefully as much as it is possible, right, this experience. It's at this point that this interesting thing called the dialectic begins. All right, now. This is where the dialect, dialectic is not something you, at this point, that you're establishing with someone else. It's not a dialogue except with yourself. And what you're now going to try to explore is the idea of the good or the one. Oh, what is interesting about that? Shouldn't be any difficulties in doing that. But if there are, and that blocks you or frustrates you, we're calling those things blocks on the path. And therefore, if you give it up, blocks on the path. Now, what kind of dialectic, first, before we go further into this, is essential to ask? If 
someone then, one way or the other, gains such experience, and this is perhaps an extremely interesting question for many people in traditions, why need there be anything else other than this experience? Why not that being the ultimate? Now that's a real question because within it and experiencing it, one that simultaneously with this experience is recognizes very clearly within it that it is impossible for any experience to be beyond this. It's obvious. And therefore, why need there be anything beyond this thing, since it appears very clearly in the experience to be an ultimate experience? What is known by that? What's known by that is that when one is involved in it, it is impossible to conceive of anything beyond it, more powerful than it, and a more profound experience. It's impossible, even though this experience admits of degrees within it, that's obvious, right? What we're saying is that it looks like we're now exploring why there is a need to postulate anything else other than this ultimate experience, which is sometimes described phenomenologically as a divine radiance. All right, it's also explored and meaning the impact it has, one, has on one is beauty itself. In the symposium, it's also called the perfection of beauty. Well, that's why there's a dialectic. Because this is a very important question. Why is there a need for another? Why need there be another? Why isn't that ultimate? Okay, there's several reasons. Let's take a look at them. One is that Is there an awareness of the experience being experienced? If anybody can say that this experience is capable of being uh, more profoundly participated in, then if that's what is going on in the experience, then there is an awareness within the experience for a more profound experience. This is really two sides of one point, so let's just call it A and B for the moment. There are uh, experience of this where there is no sense of other. And therefore, one A and one B for, for this kind of experience or the person experiencing 
that in no sense, that since there's no sense of another, point one and point one B, one A and one B, would not be applicable. Right? Now, that is to say, all right, if we can picture this, there's a simultaneous, undifferentiated, continuum of which there is no sense of duality but identity. Let's take case number two for a few minutes, all right? Case number two. Because case number one, A and B, is relatively simple to deal with. And perhaps we should do that right now, since it's easy to do. Both A, one A and one B presuppose an awareness while one is in the experience, and therefore it's a dual. Right, then there's a two-ness to it. That's not a one, that's a duality. And given that, one still can raise the question, good heavens, which is more ultimate? Since in the ultimate experience, there is still the subject. And therefore, it generates these kinds of questions naturally and as a consequence of it. Two. Right. There it is, no sense of other same experience. We go over here now for a few minutes. To play now presupposes you can do the following. If there is a oneness, presupposes there must be a one. If there's a union of something, then something must have been brought together in a unitary state. If there's some wholeness, then there must certainly have been a whole from which a wholeness can be derived. If there's a process involved, then obviously if you go to the condition for something, that's responsible for something that has a higher rank than the thing from which it is derived. That's the case. All of this seems clearly to be generated out of the one or the good. Now, with this kind of reflection, which we can go in later if you want to, it raises the question of whether or not if you presuppose something that exists prior to the thing and the other is dependent upon it for its existence, whether the thing, therefore, that comes first in principle has a greater priority and significance than the thing from which it is derived. That's all. Fine. Well, let's apply it here. Since this experience of beauty itself, the perfection of beauty, if you behold it, that's the Greek word idea, idea, that's beholding the good. That's why it's called an idea or an idea. When you behold it, you are aware on reflection of these three aspects. Well, if the thing, therefore, is being experienced, has no limits, it's unlimited. You can't find any limits to it. Therefore, it's unlimited has no boundary, has no boundary in any way, right, in that sense, unlimited. But you know what you can say about it? You can clearly say that it has these three aspects. 
in a unity. And anything that, three, that has three aspects into a unity, brought together into a unity, for those three aspects to be brought together into a unity presupposes they can be brought together in the unity and therefore whatever is responsible for bringing it into a unity, how three can become one in that respect, whatever it is that is prior to it, that's the condition for it, must itself be more perfect than the thing that's generated in such a state. Uh-oh. But didn't we say that presupposes a unity? That's certainly an overwhelming oneness. But then that raises the question necessarily that that oneness of three aspects, unlimited, boundaryless, must proceed from a one. One or good. Why one or good? Because in this experience, it's obvious, it's, it is obvious that it is good since you experience in it bliss. And you can't experience bliss with anything unless you accept it as good. The good and bliss go together, right? <laughs> I mean, who would want anything other than something good when you are experiencing bliss in it with it? So therefore, it's necessarily part and parcel of this kind of experience. Well, then, there's a goodness, necessarily a goodness. Well, in the same logic we used before, right, goodness presupposes good, and therefore, if that's an ultimate in that sense, then all things desire the good for a good reason. Because by participating in it, you, you have to then match its goodness, and to that degree you experience it. Now look here. The one has that side too. Right? Even though the one is kind of, <laughs> kind of pure and seems remote from anything that has any kind of immediacy to it, cold, but look here, if anything becomes one, it must do it by coming together, right? Something must be come together to make it one. And in that coming together as one, there must be communion with it, communication within it. There must be a kind of communication where there's a communion within it such that then you can say there is a oneness that has been brought together. Well, that presupposes a one. Now, wait a minute now. Now that we've done this quick sketch, someone now, therefore, presumably, is going to go through a meditation on the one. Well, what would it be like? Well, one thing, can't be this, because it presupposes the one. Well, okay, let's see how it might be approached. Well, from what we're saying, anything becomes a one, and we want to become a one, then it must be because a union is established, right? A union is established by bringing together the parts. And in that parts, there's a communion of the parts and a communicating in it, in it, through it. But that's a union. Well, that is a oneness. Well, then what would it be just to explore the one by itself? We don't want to go into union or oneness if we're after the one. So we must push our search a little bit further. Um, Proclus has something quite interesting at the end of his commentary on the Parmenides, uh, which luckily enough I just thought of. Um, let me see if I can get it for you. i put it here, okay? See whether you go along with this reasoning. 
He said, we all have an idea of the one. All have an idea of the one. Whatever we experience, we know is other. Therefore, there must be some grasp in some way of this I mean, when someone steps on our toes, we immediately feel that they've violated some psychic space that we have. There is something there. Now, you may call it self, soul, mind, consciousness, whatever you want to call it. At this point, it doesn't matter. But the reason it doesn't matter is because the point we're going to make doesn't depend upon our deciding which one, is the, which one of those is a better term, because would you not agree, whichever one you use, it presupposes some kind of boundary, presupposes some kind of boundary between what you're going to call you and all else. Oh, huh, that's all. Therefore, it's f different from all else. Well, then it's different from all else. It's other, right? It's other, it's different. So it looks like, of course, this is what Proclus points out. He says, this is where we get our idea of the one because of this kind of experience. This is where we get it. But if that's not the one, if that's not a, I mean, if, if that's an intimation, if, if that's a uh, glimpse of a one, it's not a one, because we know a pure one, you cannot contrast it with something else, because then there would be something else with which to contrast it, and that's a two. So this is only an intimation. Right, we can't use that, though it's a good way to start. So we'll just take it off. Well then, then you can't use yourself as a basis or any part of it unless you come up with something. But you're being required now to think about the possibility or in meditating on the nature of the one. Look, look this is a very curious question. Look here. What, after all, is the nature of the one. Well, <laughs> look here, if it has a nature, if it has a nature, <laughs> I mean, if you have a dog, if you have chalk, if you have whatever it is, you're different than the thing which you have. So therefore, that one better not have a nature, otherwise you got a two, you don't have a one. <laughs> Well then. What's the Greek word for nature? Pardon? What's the Greek word for nature? Uh, pardon? When he says, what after all is the nature of one, what is the Greek word for the nature? Yeah. Uh, actually, it's not in there. The translator put it in. Oh. Yeah, that's a different translation. That's several translations. Oh, but it's not, it's not, oh, it's, okay. it should be fusus, right? It should be fusus, but it's not there. And, uh, uh, just to answer your question. Um, The Loeb has it, the Rouse is the one I was quote, quoting a moment ago. Uh, Shari has, but if some contradiction is 
is always seen coincidentally with it, the one, so that it is no more appears to be one than the opposite, there would forthwith be need of something to judge between them. It would compel the soul to be at a loss and to inquire by arousing thought, noose, in itself and to ask, whatever then is the one as such? Now, if we want a pure one, remember, it can't be contrasted with anything else in order to understand it because then you're really contrasting it with something else. You're not talking about the one itself, but how it can be contrasted with something else. So we don't, we can't do that. So we really just have to say what it is we can talk about when we talk about the one itself. Right. What is it as such? Well, in philosophy, the difference between philosophy and religion, of course, is that book religions, that book religions often have a cosmology. A cosmology, a cosmology to explain how the universe came into being. And therefore, you need a god or some force to bring it into being. And that's a creative activity of a deity. Now, what we're doing is not a cosmology. We're doing a metaphysical cosmology. We're saying, now look here. What must be such that there could be something rather than nothing? We're asking a curious question. We're saying, look here, independent of whether this entire universe perishes or not, we can still ask the question of what kinds of what what kinds of conditions what kinds of conditions must there be in place? To have not a not the universe, but this being itself, to have reality. This is this, another word for this, by the way, is the nature of ultimate reality. Sometimes written as just being. So what conditions must there be to have being, capital B, or this thing we have just labored to describe. So look here. Let's see if we can do something with us now. Take this off. Let's combine two things here. A cosmology and a metaphysics. All right? Metaphysics. All right? The one or the good. Has such a perfection that it can be said to figuratively to overflow. Let me use another word for overflow. All right. um, the one of the good is, is of such a nature that its influence, like if you can think of it this way, a candle is so interesting, it's a source of light. What is the brilliance around the candle? That's the light. That brilliance. 
Now the one, when it overflows, it's influence, it's influence. So it's not, it is not sterile. It's influence, it's power, it's influence. It's nothing other than this experience. That's what this is. Now, according now, we're going to go into cosmology. The other name for this, remember, is the idea of the good. This is said to be the source of the sun in our universe. And it's also the source of light. We can actually now talk about it this way. The offspring of the good is the idea of the good, this divine radiance which in turn it gives birth to the sun and to light. As the sun itself gives birth to light on a lesser plane. Now that's metaphysics. Now if we give a name to this, if we personify this brilliance, right? this ultimate reality and call it Zeus or the Demiurgos, then this must also be, in principle, the source of all intelligence. Remember our diagram? Intelligence, power, and being. Therefore, these are, this is the archetype. This is the realm of um, the intelligibles as experienced simultaneously in such a condition. Let me do that again. What do, what do these people mean when they're talking about <clears throat> the nature of reality? Because if there is any difficulty that people have it's a, because of certain translations that have complicated this beyond measure. Jowett was one of the great translators who unfortunately created part of this problem. It's this word, forms. Plato's doctrine of the forms. If you see many chairs, there should be a chair in heaven. That's the form of the chair. So the argument goes. No, 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 no. See, how is it that the, so this is another translation of the word idea. That's another translation of the word idea. That's all, just another translation. The way in which he describes it, let's see if we can do that for a moment. Think of a mathematician, okay? Take a mathematician first. Let's assume now he knows all there is to know about mathematics. Right, all the way to number theory, complex theories, set theory, transfinite numbers, it goes on and on, mastering all the different forms of mathematics. Wouldn't you agree, however, that this person sees through their knowledge? They don't see it in pieces. It's all fused. It's part of the way in which they understand what it is they know. Therefore, it's transparent. It is transparent to them. Now, if this person went on and mastered all languages, right, a whole bunch, would you not agree that also be able to, if anyone was talking to them in any language, they wouldn't have to stop and take out a dictionary and a grammar. Their knowing of these different languages would be transparent just as well. Therefore, there's a fluidity of their learning now, you and I may say, oh, wait a minute, we can break up what they know and break it up into pieces and break it up into categories, but it isn't that way in the person who knows. They just see through what it is they know. Well, then, wait a minute. All that mathematics and all of that language is brought together in one person. 
Now do the same thing with logic. They can now they know all the systems of logic and analogy. I'd say they know all the systems of mathematics, they know all the systems of language, they know all the systems of analogy. Right? How, how is it within them that they know it? There's a simultaneous whole, transparent. Would you agree with that? Okay, take that as an example of knowing. Now, instead of mathematics as such, how about the necessary mathematics for the universe? All right, simple test. We'll have a test, by the way, next week. And We'll see if we can get someone to devise the test. And it would be, do you understand the total set of mathematics which would explain completely our universe? Right? The person who would have it, though, would see through it just as transparently as they would their own native language. Therefore, all of these forms, you see, exist simultaneously, simultaneously as a whole. And when they have that simultaneously as a whole, they're lit and we can call them bright. And we can, in fact, say they're luminous in their knowing. That's what we want to call it now. All right, okay, now look here. Then this is therefore, this is also, cosmologically speaking, this is the idea in the mind of God when he created the universe only it exists simultaneously as a whole, and therefore this created universe is nothing other but a universe in which the simultaneous whole unfolds according to time, sequentially. It doesn't exist as a simultaneous whole. Therefore, one of the essential elements in the creation must have been time from eternity. Now, let us now go back, all right? now. We now want to then say, the source of all, the source of what really is, is not just this, but this. And everybody wants to know their father. Everyone wants to know their source, their mother. Everyone wants to know their source. Therefore, what do you think it's like when someone then, who has explored this as an ultimate experience then, is brought into the discussion we're having tonight, and now they're saying, you mean to tell me there is something beyond what I've experienced? But that's impossible. That's just simply impossible. It violates their experience. Say, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're right. No, it's not. It's not an experience. The one of the good is not an experience. An experience has a beginning and it has an end, right? And it goes through a period of time. That's not this. So I think it would be appropriate, therefore, for you people now who have tried the game of contemplating or meditating on the nature of the one, to talk about what possible problems you had exploring this so we can use a real example rather than my making one up. I have two things I want to say. No, I'll wait. Okay. Yes? When, when we, we is I guess maybe I'll say theoretically, when we get to the one and we look back and we see a created, a, a created uh, universe, are we not speaking, speaking figuratively? Yes. That created universe, that created universe does not in fact exist. Either does the no, no, no. because exist in the proper sense is only proper for this, for this realm. That's right. Right. As a matter of fact, we can bring that in. We can say, to make this point that you're making, this is our everyday world, and we want to separate it and use a special language for that. This is the realm of existence. 
this realm that we were talking about, sometimes called the idea of the good, right? that's called being. That's the difference between the two. Being never ceases to be what it is. It never undergoes change. And therefore, it is an eternal thing that continues to be what it is eternally, because it is eternity itself, and that's different from existence. That's right. This has only a loose temporal existence. It's going to have a beginning. Right, there it goes through time. Yeah, you know, everything. See, anything in here comes and goes. It really is a shadow of this idea. You are, in fact, nothing other than an idea in the mind of God. Okay, let me try one more step on this. Okay, just to push it one more step. In this kind of meditation, you are in a, in a real sense for a certain period of time engaged in an interior dialogue. Now, what's important in this kind of meditation on the one is to be, remember what we said about music, you should be able, through music, to be able to identify different states of mind right? and their images and their opposites to whatever degree they appear. This is where you need it now in this meditation because in this interior dialogue, all right, in this interior dialogue, if you can detect to any degree an image, an image, an accent, as it were, any, anything that can be associated with the voice within you, either the one that you're holding or the answering voice within you, right? then you know that therefore you're still at a nice interesting place in your meditation but you have to proceed until you can then hear see experience no image voice no image All right uh, inner voice pure pure no image no association. Right. This kind of dialogue, therefore, inward dialogue, then allows you to uh, deal with the content, whatever content you're dealing with, to the degree that it reaches a resolution. To that degree, you have reached a rest a rest which is a silence because you have become silent yourself by dealing with these inward voices that each one is challenging you in your own pursuit. If this is the highest goal you have, then all the doubts and the worries and all of the frustrations and getting something terribly significant are now going to emerge and bounce at you and you're going to be in this inward struggle. Therefore, the degree then that you can deal adequately with this inner dialogue, to that degree you're moving a step ahead. Now, in this rest and silence, there might in fact be out of that silence, right, uh, a loss of identity. Remember what we said before about music, right? Uh, to whatever degree you have a persona, a mask, no matter what kind, there is always a certain fear at this moment of the loss of identity in such an inward experience, right? That has to then become the subject of the dialogue. That has to be challenged. That has to be challenged. So therefore it can continue without that voice that's holding you back to former images. Now, all right? Now, 
remember now what you're doing through all of this is so called the meditation on the one. And all we've been talking about is the drama aspect of it. Does the voice take on an image? As you listen to it, the inner voice, what do you notice about it, right? These are ways of proceeding. The most important thing, though, behind all of this, all of this is just trivial, uh, is a sense of sincerity. You have to be sincere. There has to be a sense of sincerity to this pursuit. Therefore, you see, loss of identity is a loss of a mask. The willingness to drop a mask is, an, is another way of putting the whole problem of sincerity. So therefore, you're taking on the most important task for nothing else other than to uh, seek a source. And it's going to challenge you in this way. And now come a whole set of possible experiences. To the degree that you, you identify with it, find it enhancing, uh, seek it, you're putting something in there doing the seeking, an image of yourself. Therefore, all experiences, no matter what kind, you nod and say, hi there, and continue with your meditation. All right, so there goes another bliss. Nice. I think I'll go back there later this weekend, get back into it. But right now, you're after the source. Hmm. Now, would you not agree you're bound to have a little difficulty? The biggest difficulty is, biggest difficulty is, you don't want to do it sitting. Because then you'll think meditation has to do with formal sitting. I did do this meditation all the time, can't you? Are you holding one pen? Yeah. One. Everything you see is a one. <laughs> yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's nothing but one. Mm -hmm. Aren't these things the very things you want to do in your everyday world as well? Yeah. Well, okay, it's good to sit because if you spent a lot of money for cushions, you know, <laughs> it's good to put them to use. Yeah. And sometimes, and sometimes, it builds up power, jiriki power, and that sometimes is useful. But, continue. Now, where's the obstacle? Mm -hmm. In your last meditation. I didn't get the question. Okay, where were you stuck? Have you done this interesting exploration on meditation of the one? Good, thank you for volunteering. I have actually meditated on this question. Good. What is the one in itself? Yes, yes. And I've gotten nowhere. <laughs> Congratulations. Are we supposed to? Yeah, go ahead. That's it. No, 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 tell me more. That's all there is. What more do you want? That's all there is. Why? I don't mind, but you got nowhere. Right. And what, what do you think of that? Did you expect to get somewhere? Yeah, I expected answers galore. You, answers galore <laughs> to what the one is? Yeah. But wait a minute. Aren't you one? <laughs> well, you know, a couple wait of minute, times... Are you one? Yeah. And you don't know what you are. I don't know. That's right. About what? Whether I know what I am. Yeah, go ahead. Now, are you going to go back and sit? Well, a couple of times I have had a kind of experience of like um, getting kind of sucked in and up. 
Yeah. So okay. When I, when I um, took on the question, which was interesting. Uh, from the. In my hara, there was yeah. a kind of a coming in and going up sensation, like I was being kind of turned inside out. Yeah. Yeah. That happened yeah. twice when I ha asked yeah. myself the question. Other than that. Yeah, no, no, don't nothing. worry about other than that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> what, if you could recall just for a moment, yeah. you see, um, uh, was there any other sensation as it moved for upward? Um, like? Yeah, it was a kind of a. Where? It was a uh, kind of a. Breathless, like exhilarating. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Good, 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 good. Exhilarating. But nothing accompanied it. Yeah, yeah. As it proceeded upward, did you notice any other any other energy source or place that interested you, or found interesting in any way? Well, it seemed to be. Because your hand stops right well, here. Well, it, it like came in here, came here. And it kind of goes up my spine or something. Okay. I mean, it's back very, rather than. It's in the center. It's it's not up my spine. It's like something centrally, and it just goes. You know. But I never follow it. I mean, it, I just kind of uh, get. Um, seems like I I um, lose myself in it. Something. I lose sight of. Yeah, look at her. I lose sight of. Yeah. I lose sight of. Yeah, go ahead. I lose sight of everything. There's nothing. I don't have any thoughts that come then, or. No, no thoughts, um, right? There's no feeling. I just. just it right, just that's just, right. No thoughts, no feeling. Go ahead. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Why did you stop? I don't know. Because. No, no, no. See, this. We can have fun with our questions. Mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> but why did you stop at this point? That's a very interesting place to be. Why did you give up your question? Well, I didn't give it up. As far as I know, it just disappeared. Um, well, also, um, it seems like that's... Um, I'm ex see, I'm expecting some answer, some words of wa wisdom to say, here's the answer to what is the nature of the one. And so, um, so it was disappointing, didn't get an answer. Right, I mean, in terms of your, yeah. So, this is a voice within you. Mm -hmm. This is a voice within you that you should have continued the meditation dialogue with. Mm. So, okay. Here, uh, how would you put it in terms of your own experience? Well, I'm expecting some insight. Something that I can write down. <laughs> Something I can talk about. Um. See, there has to be some. There has to be some use for it. You have to put it to some use, right? You write it down. Talk about it. Right. Convey it to another. Convey it to another. Help another by giving them something important. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, please, is that correct? Is that the way it seems to go? Write it down, talk about it. Yeah. Because or it might what? Because it might what? Because it might be something I'd want to uh, talk about one day. Because if you were to talk about it, the other person may or persons may? May um, tell me whether I passed, whether uh, I in fact you know, uh, had an experience of the one. Yeah, okay. Then you'd want to do this in order to get it verified. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. 
right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. And that is, see, you already have a set of expectations for this quest. Yeah. All right. You should be able then write it down, talk about it, and someone will verify it. Mm-hmm. Or, if not, or if it doesn't fit into that mold, then. Well, then it's um, not really an experience of the one. Because it must have these qualities about it. Yeah. Right, and you know that because? Well, I don't really know that. What? <laughs> it's just an assumption it, I've had. Good heavens, where did you get that assumption? You mean, someone is going to have to tell you that you're... Well, I can tell you... Um, what? That I have a bias against it being simply a bodily experience like that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I don't want to think that that's... That it's a bodily experience. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. That there should be... I, it's but nonetheless, there should be something you should be able to write down and talk about. It should have some kind of mark so that you can then, right, show it to someone like, oh, yes, it's a, yes, it's a stinker oven. Yasha. Right? Mm-hmm. Yes, right? Right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. By the way, um, would they be judging you or what you're bringing? Both. Oh, both. Two separate judgments. They'd be judging you as well as what you brought? Yeah. Why would they need both? Well, because there are both. There's me and what I experience. And it has to be an experience for you to write down and talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. (laughs) Suppose the one is not an experience. Mm, that's right, it's not. Oh, well, um, what happens to what you're saying? Then I would become the one. If I would be the one. Oh, yeah? Would there be something there to be? Yeah. Where would it be? Where? Yeah, I mean, it's gonna, you're going to be the one. It's got to be somewhere for you to be it. Just right in there. That little. <laughs> okay, that's good. Just right there. Yeah, it would have to be right there in you, right? Right, so that'd have to be you and it in you. No, really. Mm. What? Not really. Well, try to help me out. Come on, try restating it. What's your question? See, any assumption you have about it, any assumption you make about it, is going to cost you being blocked. For this process we're going through is to challenge all assumptions when they come up, such as yours. That's the dialectic. I, I didn't hear you. I don't know if you're down on Julie, but my problem is at the opposite extreme. Well, I, well, look here. With this chalk and this board, we can go to the opposite extreme of the board and do it. I have a problem even taking it on. Hold, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Go ahead. I have a problem even taking it on as a question when I'm by myself. Like in a discussion when it's being discussed, yeah. I'm not sure what I'm interested in. It's like, wow, what is the one? But when, but when I'm... I'm Myself, for after a couple of days, it just I lose that initial interest. Like, wow, what is the one? You know, what is this thing? It's like I can do it when someone is with me in discussion, but not on my own. And sometimes I'm thinking, uh, 
it's too abstract. It doesn't relate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be too abstract. Yeah, yeah. What does that mean? That's an interesting term. Too abstract, right? Right, it's too abstract. Uh, say it again. It doesn't, relate, like it doesn't relate to my life. Doesn't relate, right, right. Right. Yeah, right, right. Aren't too abstract. Yeah. That yeah, doesn't relate. I can follow in a discussion after Yeah, that. yeah, yeah, it doesn't relate, right, right. By the way, how do you know it doesn't relate? Do you know it? Well, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, you know enough about it that it doesn't relate, no, and it's too abstract. When you turn to Julie, you say, "Well, that's a pan. It's one. You're one. Okay, I can follow that, and that part relates." But then after that, it's like I don't know what that <laughs> gesture. Come on. I don't know. I don't know. Now look here. See, there are two kinds of problems. <clears throat> Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, have you tried it? And you know you can't relate to it? Just to make sure we're together. No, because part of it is I can't do What? I can't learn. But then are you talking out of your experience or what you think will happen if you were to do it? No, I've tried it. Not oh, good. Just You were going to say it's not real, right? It's not real. It doesn't relate. It's too abstract. Is that right? What does too abstract mean for you? It's, not, it's something that's not in my realm of experience. I, You're absolutely right. It's not in your realm of experience. Yeah. Correct. Good for you. Like what's watching? I've had experience of what's watching. Pardon me, what experience do you have of what's watching? Yeah. Like right now, why don't you tell us what's watching? <laughs> no, that's different because I... I'll, yeah, go ahead and do it and I'll write it down with this chalk and this board. Go ahead. They're, they're two different questions. I don't know. One, one it relates more to me than, the, than that one. Because what's yeah, watching... See, I'm not de I am not in the position of denying it. I'm wondering whether you're hearing when you're saying, I don't do it because it's too abstract and it doesn't relate to me. And when I try it, I lose interest quickly. And, and when you try it, what happens? What happens? Let's just stay like, with your experience. It seems like I'm trying, I'm forcing it when I'm asking. Forcing it? Go ahead, more. Does it come naturally? Not natural? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's forcing it. It's not natural. And then I lose interest. Uh, well, pardon me. Why do you lose interest? So far, you're quite correct. Because <laughs> it's not interesting. Pardon me. Pardon me. When, <clears throat> you're quite correct. <laughs> you're quite correct. You, it is forcing it. Yes, it, it is not natural. That's right. Now that we know that, why did you give it up? Do you have a commandment that thou shalt not do anything too abstract or that doesn't relate to you? And this violates your commandment? Yes, you're absolutely right. Hey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Forcing it. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Forcing it. And it's uh, not natural. Yeah, yeah. You're right again. That's right. Yes, now, why, not, why did you stop? It should come naturally. What? It should come naturally. Interest should be a natural interest. It should be. Yes, not forced. Oh, because okay. Forced okay. You're absolutely right. Now, do you want to talk about meditating on the one, now that we know that fits every other thing but this? Yes, you're quite right. This pulls it out of the natural world. You're right. No, yep, I mean, yep, no. yep, every time, every time, yeah, yeah. I don't mean that way. I mean, it's not, I don't feel like when I'm asking it, it comes naturally from me. I feel like it's forced. It's not that it's 
it's not natural to the world, I, it's my interest is for. So I, the deliberate look is like, what is this one? It's a one, and it's like, I feel like I'm repeating all your questions to myself, and therefore it's time to put me in that state of mind, wow, well, what is this one? I would like to be in that state, I'm, but I'm, yeah, but you don't want to go through anything to get there. And so it becomes your question, I say. It's hard to explain. Okay, what, 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 what are you finding through mm. this reflection? Well, I mean, I guess all those things I tell myself could be false, or, but I still tend to think it's... I, I can't get into that question on my own. Although when I'm in a discussion, it's interesting, but it's taken on my own. I, I can't get into it if it has these marks. Yes. Right, yes. right, 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 so right. Because if you would, then you'd be getting into something that's too abstract and doesn't relate. What? Is that right? Let's do it again. No, no, I don't mind that part of There's two steps. Trying it on my own, I feel like it's forced. It's not my interest to come. Wait a minute, hold it. You're quite right. It's forcing it. Yes, go ahead. Good for you. So far, you're doing good. And then, and then it's like a, the whole thing just seems too abstract. It doesn't relate. It so seems what? Too abstract. I don't know what that means. What does it mean when you say too abstract? Like. I can't relate it to anything. <laughs> huh? I cannot relate it to anything. Yeah, you're right. <clears throat> yeah, right, right again. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Can't relate it to anything. My gosh, you're right again. <laughs> doing well so far, doing good. Go ahead. Mm. Okay. Uh, d does this mean anything to you, forcing it? Does that have a history to it? Well, it's not so much that, but it's the <clears throat> It's the other state. It's the other state. Where I'm genuinely, the question has me, and it's interesting. That, what, I don't know. All I know is, I, that is not the other state. I'm going to be in the other state, and that's not it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're quite right. You would rather be in the other state. Yeah, yeah. Well, then, you're not into this particular meditation. But the only thing that I thought maybe we could look at was this sentence of yours, or this statement of yours, about forcing. I'm repeating your questions to myself. It's repetitive. Yeah. To try to generate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, um, you, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, let me give a perfect example. What is more foolish, abstract, than what is Mu in Buddhism? And people who take that koan have to take it artificially, and they have to take it artificially, and they have to push themselves artificially until, until a point comes when it becomes their own. And if you're, uh, if you're familiar with the three pillars of Zen of Kaplow, the Canadian housewife has a great example of it. She's gone to six sessions. That, that session is an intense meditation experience of about seven days. And she's been through six of them, as well as 30 days in uh, Burma. So she's had this background. In the seventh one, she's going around with the koan, Mu, what is Mu, what is Mu? And she's taking, she's in the bathtub, and she says, oh my God, what the hell is, what is, what is it? It's hers, see. It took that long for it to become hers. There's no way around it. There isn't any other way around it. Because if you were to take the question, what is Mu, you'd be going around saying that stinker, that Roshi gave me a foolish question. What am I asking his question for? Or is it even a question? What, what is, how stupid can I be going around asking a question that doesn't have an answer? <clears throat> you have to fight it because, see, you're doing something 
for which you cannot get anything for it. You're not going to get a star. <clears throat> You're not going to get a merit badge. You can't sell it, can't brag about it. Can't even put it on your resume. Can't even, yes, what could be worse? You cannot even put it on your resume. <laughs> And that's what's great about it. It's totally worthless. <laughs> totally, it is totally worthless. Yeah. You can't do anything with it. You can't get two and put it in a bag. You can't give one away for Christmas. You can't do anything with it. No, you can't do anything with it. Which is why it's priceless. Which is why what? Why it's priceless. Priceless. Uh. <laughs> Yeah. I think we work too much for this evening. What do you think? Huh? Well, no. Hold it. Hold it. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Oh. No, no. Well, well, I see another hand up. Yes. Yeah. Mm. You were going to say there was two kinds Two things. Of I covered one. Two kinds of problems. No. Oh, two kinds of problems. Yeah, you were saying that. What about the other thing, two things you <laughs> Well, um, this is the kind of a problem that you have to take on artificially. Like, what is move? What is the sound of one hand clapping in the wind? All right? Stop a railroad. A uh, train coming down on the railroad tracks, right? Stop a sailing ship. Show me the orange you ate yesterday. Yeah, well, take that as a yes. Yeah, that's a different kind of problem. Where on the face of it, you're going to have to accept something as meaningful, even though you haven't got the faintest idea that it is meaningful goes beyond your everyday experience. You can't use your natural world to answer it. It cannot be likened to anything else, thank goodness. Because if there is anything other than the everyday world, let's hope it's significant, because the everyday world isn't significant at all. Okay, good, good, yeah. good, good, hold it. Should we, should you go through the other practices before you start this one? Like in the Republic, you, you're supposed to have gone through all of these. Well, you see, you're, you see, if you start with arithmetic, which is, you know, what is the one as such, right? then at least you're on some level that is, has some kinship. You might even think it's mathematics. Uh, but but you see, the experiences you were saying were required to really to get to this stage. You were saying that there were five yeah. different. Yes. Don't those experiences yes. require? Yes. This is a Platonic vision. Uh, I think perhaps the best way to do it would be to skip it and just do it. <laughs> get on the fast track. And so would you have the experience of... You, you would have to, actually, what you'd have to do is recover all of these things on your own. No. Because, like music, <clears throat> music in the sense of Plato. See, if, if you do this inner dialogue, you're going to have to listen to your own inner voice, and you're going to have to see whether or not you can trust it. You trusted it. You were conned by your own thought. So, you see, if, if you want like a simpler thing to do, just to show you what I mean, all right? A very interesting thing, which, which uh, I, I think just fundamentally it's good to know, is what precedes a thought? Okay? Literally, what precedes a thought? All, right. All you do, you watch thoughts. 
Now, wait a minute. You've got to be very quick. Because we want to see what precedes it. Now, look here. Let me even make it shorter. All right? you ever, obviously, you have the same kind of problem. Uh, everyone has the same kind of problem. Do you have to wait for the end of the thought to know what the thought is saying? I mean, you have to go through all this labor of listening to some inner voice, spell it out grammatically so you understand what you're saying to yourself? No. You know the whole thing. Then what is this subvocal language going on? It's redundant. Now, wait a minute. Try this thing. All right? You're just watching thoughts. You say, you get the first three words, you know where it's going. Chop it off. Say, thank you very much. I don't have to hear the rest of it. <laughs> no, no, seriously. Why? Because of what reason? Because you want to see what precedes it. This will sharpen you. It will give you a nice sense of humor. You'll enjoy it. What you'll discover is that there is something that precedes it. In every case. Which contains the whole thing as a seed. And you don't need all this. Now, look here. This thing. has an image. It has an image that accompanies it. It has an image, see? And these images, is, they're very good to know what kind of an image it is. Is it an image of your father, your mother, your uncle, your teacher, your friend? <coughs> because if you can spot the image that attends that thought, how does that benefit you? You know its source. Right. Ah, so what are you learning? Music. How to identify states of mind, different names. You're going to be so. Hey, by the way, to do this, you may have to then somehow get a little bit of energy going in order to sustain this for a while because it's not easy. So you're going to have to start energizing yourself in a variety. You're going to, re you're going to rebuild the Republic, I think, naturally. But that in itself is energizing, to spot that image. Yes, yeah, yeah. Until you find out one you may not particularly like. <laughs> All right, okay. All right, what do you say? You blow the whistle? Thank you.